welcome everyone to our uh, work meeting for November 5th, starting at 532. Uh, as usual, we'll start out with our council reports. So, council, do you have anything to report on any of your committees? We can uh, start with anybody who wants to speak first. Okay, I have um, a couple of different things. Um, on our youth council, um, they have gotten the new board together and so since i'm new to this too and so is the leader we need to find out when we're supposed to do the swearing in of the new kids i don't know when that normally occurs or or how that's done or with everything going on how it's going to be done or whatever in well, the past they've just came to one of the council meetings yeah okay all right um and then um on one of the others, the Communities That Cares, um, I'll be attending. Are you attending tomorrow or Monday? Yes, I am. Uh, the mayor and I will be attending a key leader orientation tomorrow um, for our Communities That Cares. And then I had the opportunity this morning to um, not attend but zoom in to the Davis Chamber of Commerce legislative um, uh, meeting and the chamber has set as their three focuses for this year um, education health care and economic development and they've set goals in um, all of those areas but one of the things that I wanted to share is um, regarding the upcoming legislative session it will run this year from Tuesday January 19th to March 4th because of the change that was accepted um, President Adams is going to have more of a hybrid session so that there can be online participation. And this affects our youth council, but there will not be large groups permitted at the Capitol this year. So most likely the youth thing will be canceled um, and no organized events will be permitted. They're building new community committee rooms in the state and Senate office buildings to accommodate larger attendance at those meetings. Um, and they normally when you go you can leave a note and the legislator will come out they're going to do away with the notes this year but they still haven't figured out how they're going to respond whether it'll be via a text or some other method they're they're still working on that so that's all i have to report that's a lot and by the way anybody any of the council members you guys are welcome to jump on this key leader meetings as well there's what, one tomorrow and then tuesday Monday or Tuesday. So if you're interested, just let get a hold of Don or myself, and we'll we'll set you up. Okay. Anybody? It's two else? and a half hours long, so if you don't want to really jump on it, <laughs> <laughs> now you spoiled it. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, okay. Councilman Morris. Yeah, we a couple of of uh, meetings. There was a Utopia meeting, uh, middle of October, and just to just to highlight. In, in Layton City, we're fully built out for Utopia, over 20,000 um, availability as far as residential units. And we're about almost 7,000. So just right around 30% take rate, which is great because that, that helps. That was our the, target, so that's good. That we helps. Need, we need to hit that target. And there's plenty of, plenty of space and plenty of room for, for others. Uh, it's been advantageous. I know we had during uh, the early part of the pandemic with the kids home from from college i think we had three zoom meetings going on at the same time in the house <laughs> and no issue with the bandwidth or or uh, the computer speed so we're great it's great so that's that's uh there's an event from from last month and then this week we had the utah league of cities and towns hosted another town hall for uh, it was an economic update and the COVID update and the economic part of it probably depends more on the, the COVID part of it on what we do as, as, as citizens throughout the state. Economy is coming back uh, slowly. We see it here, here in, in Layton where things are going well, uh, which is good. Uh, we had former Lieutenant Governor Greg Bell talk a little bit. He's now the CEO of the Utah Hospital Association. And he talked about the fact that, uh, well, I'll just read what he said. He said that we've lost control <laughs> of, uh, uh, of the situation with COVID 
and uh, we don't have a handle on it were two things that he said verbatim, which is unfortunate uh, knowing what we can do to help prevent the spread. Uh, today we, overwhelming record today as far as cases go in the state of Utah, upwards of, of 2,800 cases. Um, and at the same time in Davis County, over 300, which is 100 over any previous record. Plus the school closure. And we had uh, North, North, excuse oh. me, Northridge go online. So we're late and we're up to almost 2,100 cases here in the, that we've had during this time. Not sure, not sure what else you could say or what else um, what we could do from here other than it's up to all of us. I know there's been given some directions been given by the governor uh, with us being in the high transmission area in Davis County of, of keeping social gatherings to under 10 people, um, having activities with, with just your household, meaning those that are within the walls of your own home. Which is which is tough to because <laughs> we love our families and we love getting together. So, at the same time, it's not going anywhere, and and would hate to hate to see what happens next if we can't get this under control. We've done it before, wearing masks, six foot. We've got signs here. We know what to do. We just for some reason we're not doing it um, enough and to make a difference. So, anyway, that that was a sobering report from from uh, Greg Bell. And his, his main thrust was that the hospitals are, are in trouble and getting full. So, yeah, please, yeah. So those, those were my two so, items. So, in addition to what Greg had to say at that is, is he talked about ICU beds. And one of the things that I thought was interesting is, is that there are different types of ICU beds. And he talked about for the COVID patients that they need the ones with negative pressure because of the infection um, and and so that even limits it a little bit more and then in the meeting I was in um, this morning Judy Williamson from the Layton IHC hospital said that they have COVID patients but once they are intubated they are then transferred to McKady because they only have four ICU beds at our Layton facility and they can't handle the intubation they needed to be at a larger facility so I thought that was even more kind of concerning for our area that the impact could be pretty real here well, of the 17 beds available up there, 11 are occupied right now as of today. So it's it's serious. Okay. Anyone else? I will say regarding Utopia, I continually run into people that have not got it or question about it. So I think, uh, you know, as council members or anybody out there who's got it, let, let your neighbors know how wonderful it is because it, I've had three other people now sign up since I've talked to them just in the last probably two and a half weeks. And I'm sure a lot of it has to do with bandwidth, but yeah, it's it's a great system. Okay, there's no other reports. Um, we get to go on our training moment with our city attorney, Mr. Gary Crane. <laughs> well, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. I feel like I should run down from there. <laughs> um, just a thought. In all the years I was in scouting, I remember one instance in particular which taught me how a 12-year-old learns. There were a couple of them sitting around the fire, the campfire at night, and they were rolling in tissue paper leaves. <laughs> you see where this is going, right? Yeah. There's this campfire and there's this tissue paper and leaves in the tissue paper. And I thought, you know, I know exactly what they're going to do. And the other boys were all standing around watching these two. And I said, you know, you two, don't do what, what you're going to do. Because if you do, you'll regret it. And so I go into the tent for five minutes and I come back out. And the two boys that had the tissue paper and the leaves had singed eyebrows and singed hair all the way up. <laughs> and all I could say is, you did it, didn't you? And, oh, yeah, they did it. They, they lit it on fire, and it burned a lot faster than they'd seen on TV, right? So there are three ways of learning. One is that I can tell you all about it. The second one is you can experience it yourself. 
And the third one is that you can watch somebody else experiencing it. And I think the last two are most effective, maybe the last one. Hopefully, you, you don't have to experience what they experience in order to learn you don't light those things on fire. So what I thought we'd do tonight, uh, and Tom, excuse me because you've already seen this, or anybody that was at uh, the Planning Commission meeting has seen this, but there's two videos I want to show you just really quickly. They're Fox 13 clips. You've probably seen them. But what I'd like to do afterwards is ask you what these folks ought to learn from the experience that they've just gone through. So... If you don't mind, lights, camera, and we'll do the first. A Fox 13 News investigation has uncovered name calling, insults, profanity, and general dysfunction within the Salt Lake City School Board. Some of it has been public during meetings to discuss the district's response to COVID-19, but not all of it. Fox 13's Adam Herbetz joins us now with what we found. <laughs> Kelly, Salt Lake City is still Utah's only public school district that is online only. No kids allowed in the classroom. The records we've reviewed show the COVID-19 debate has led to some unprofessional and possibly unethical behavior by school board members. The Salt Lake City School District has seven board members but only a few were willing to speak to Fox 13 about the messages they thought would remain private. I'm sorry about that. Um, Catherine needs to leave right. on what we're talking about. But I'd like to end this meeting now. Some parents have complained about a lack of professionalism at meetings. I've seen the chat. This is, this is um, this, you know, I've seen myself get roasted in the chat. Um, okay, I, let's not. This is an important I'm not, part see, this is, this is One parent decided to take it a step further. Further. What's going on behind the scenes that we're not being told? Raina Williams, who has five children in the district, filed a public records request asking for copies of school board emails and text messages. Together, we read hundreds of them. I can't believe you went through all those emails. And some stood out more than others. I'll let you read it because there's some words not appropriate for church. You gotta be kidding me. On July 21st, Catherine Kennedy was upset when the board meeting didn't end on time. We've never stopped at a hard stop when we well, put on. Instead of leaving early, she started typing a colorful message to board president Melissa Ford. never talk that way about colleagues or clients. And if that's a language she uses to express herself, then evidently she can go back to school and get some more English words that she can use without using felt. I move that we adjourn now. With that, the meeting ended just a few weeks before the start of school, but still no reopening plan for more than 20,000 kids and their parents to start getting ready. <laughs> that same meeting, board member Mike Namelka wasn't texting. I'm technology illiterate. I don't send texts to anybody. But he was playing solitaire. I'm not going to lie. I just sure I did, you know, but I knew what was going on. And playing solitaire is no different than those guys in there texting while they're listening to what's going on. Records show board members Nate Salazar and Sam Hansen exchanged at least 200 text messages, often complaining about parents or principals who disagree with their opinion to keep students online. I'm frustrated that a decision hasn't been made yet. One of their targets was Jared Wright, the principal of West High. Gosh, guys, like that's just so backhanded. Jared Wright was the principal of two of my sons. He has an excellent reputation. In some cases, they don't respect the principals at all. Mike Namelka's biggest concern has to do with emails, especially the ones that were intentionally sent to everyone except him. Thought you might be interested in an additional set of school safety concerns. I have not bothered to send it to Mr. Namelka since I doubt he will be receptive. That's clearly against district policy, and Namelka believes it's also a violation of Utah's Open and Public Meetings Act, a state law that is supposed to stop elected officials from privately colluding on public policy. 
the penalty is a Class B misdemeanor. I was taught this the very first year I was there. You can't even send an email to four people. It's pretty obvious from watching the board meetings that anytime Michael tries to speak, he's kind of written off. That masks do the job. Do you think that there are things missing? Yes, absolutely. Three of the board members did not supply complete text messages. Are you Michelle? Yeah. My name's Adam. I'm with Fox 13 with the news. Hi. Michelle Tui Tupo says that's because she typically deletes her messages, which she started doing even before joining the school board. Nate Salazar and Catherine Kennedy have ignored multiple requests for comment. They need to be very transparent of what's going on. I try to get along with them all, but they just don't think the same way I think. We reached out to the spokesperson for the Salt Lake City School District. She referred us to the employee handbook, which indicates there are likely multiple violations here. Otherwise, the district would not comment. You can read all of the messages between board members that we've received on fox13now.com. Reporting in studio, Adam Herbetz, Fox 13 News, Utah. Okay. So how many of you have seen this? How many of you saw it? So they've got singed eyebrows, singed hair, <laughs> the whole nine yards, right? And uh, what do we learn by looking at it? Uh, two particular sets of laws were violated, right? The Open Meetings Act and Grandma, right? And uh, what do you learn from this? Just a couple things. I'm not going to take long, but just a couple things. What do you learn from this, from their experience? What can you learn from their experience? Anything? Should you be texting when you're on the podium to each other? No. Absolutely not. Okay. Um, can you text outside of a meeting to each other? About something you're make, going to make a decision on. There's nothing that prohibits you from texting each other outside of a meeting. However, if three or more of you get together on a text and begin to make a decision about something that is before you to make a decision on, then the same rules governing open meetings and what a meeting is and when you can make decisions apply in that situation. Now, can you just text each other about issues in the city? Sure you can. There's no problem with that. What about recognizing what is and is not discoverable that, uh, that you have in your possession, in your phone, on your computer? How far do you think the press could go if they sent a grandma request to this public body? Could they go to their text messages? Anything to do with the school district, their text messages? Yep, yeah, they could. Could they go as deep as to ask for all of their emails to any member of the school board or regarding anything that the school board was discussing at the time? Yep. Yeah, yeah, they can do that. How many did he say they had? They come up with over 2,000, I think is what they said. There are emails back and forth, and especially the two gentlemen that were on the board. Um, and then the exclusion of the, the other member became real obvious as to what was happening. Can you do that type of thing? Are you allowed to exclude another member of the council in the decisions that you make? The answer is no, you can't. You don't have the right to do that. The whole purpose of the Open Meetings Act is to be able to have public bodies make decisions on public matters and deliberate on public matters in public meetings. And if you're deliberating about a matter that you're going to have to make a decision on or that you are responsible for making a decision on and you're doing it outside of a public meeting, it probably is not appropriate. And hopefully you never end up on TV and hopefully you never end up in using I this I've never come across a body in Layton City that has ever used language like that lady used on uh, in referring to each other or even referring to citizens that's horrible anything else that you might have questions on regarding what happened there that's pretty self-evident isn't it there's a whole series of articles. After this, they actually had another article, and we don't have time, otherwise we'd play it. But um, the other article actually had a, a BYU expert on open meetings and, and uh, pol political 
governments, and uh, and he he outlined the things that that were violated. You know, the the sad thing is, how many kids were in that school district? They said about twenty thousand kids, and they all suffered because of what the politics of what was going on that night. No decision was made. Um, no plan was put together. You know, for how they would handle it. That's probably the bigger problem is that when this type of thing goes on amongst uh, council members and and uh, board members, it wastes the public's time, that valuable time that you have together to be able to make important decisions. And I think probably that's, that's the biggest uh, downfall or, or harm that occurred as a result of that. Anyway, I appreciate, I've got to tell you, I appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate our council. I appreciate the past councils of Layton City. I've been here almost 30 years, and I have never had anything even close to that happen on any council in Layton City, and I'm grateful for that. And I look at this council, it's not going to happen, but it's good to know uh, at least the principles behind these types of things that are happening out there. So any, any other questions? Yeah, I, I got a question that kind of came from the Planning Commission when Mason presented it. He, he was a little more tough saying that they really shouldn't talk to each other at all outside of the meetings, but it is okay one-on-one. -on -one. Me and Zach could talk, me and Clint could talk, as long as there's not three of us, right? That's correct, yeah. That's correct. That's good policy. That's and good then, policy. <clears throat> my other, my question more was, they talked a little bit about and, and they're a little different than us as elected people because they're appointed, but he, he was talking about if I go and talk to a citizen or a citizen comes to me, can you explain a little bit what needs to be disclosed in the meeting from that conversation? Okay. If I were speaking to the Planning Commission, I would tell them not to talk to citizens outside of the meeting about decisions that they're making, period. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. Don't go to a group meeting, a neighborhood meeting, those types of things. City councils are a little bit different because you're a legislative body and you are elected to listen to people. Um, when you do listen to people, the best approach, uh, especially if it's on something that you're making a decision on, um, I discourage you from going to, for example, a neighborhood meeting on your own outside of the council because they don't get the, the true essence of what was discussed at that meeting. You do, but they don't. The rest of the council does not. And so I discourage that. I don't think that's a good idea. But at the same time, if you bump into somebody at the grocery store and talk to them about some of the issues, um, the, best, the best thing for a city council to do, the elected body to do, is to disclose during the course of the discussion on the matter who you've talked to and what you've talked about. And that's, that's probably the best advice I can give you is make sure you, that, otherwise it, it really does come back to bite you. Because somebody's going to stand up at the podium and they're going to say, well, Tom was at the meeting, or I met Tom at the grocery store the other day, and he said he was in favor of my application and that there's no way that the council should vote against this application. And that comes back to bite you. It really does. Because we've had that happen uh, on a number of occasions where new council folks have gone out, and it really is the newer council folks, when they take the position, they're excited you know, to, to go and respond to citizen requests. And we've seen that backfire and just come around to bite them right uh, in the public meeting. So does that help answer the question? So you can talk to others, but disclosure is the best way. And I would avoid it if it's something you're having to make a decision on. Yeah, you've, I've heard you tell us that before, but some of these new guys maybe haven't. That's a good, good question. Very good question. So any other questions? Okay, thanks. The only other advice I'd say is that if you do get cornered or feel pressured to kind of meet with somebody, make sure you take another council person with you. Yes. Because you do not want to go by yourself. I mean, I... Yeah. Just don't take two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard Tom say yeah. that. <laughs> one. Just don't take two. Just one. Take one other one. <laughs> take someone with you. Take one of the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. Rope me in, though. Both the mayor is I'm a member of the that. council. And she will vote in the event of a what? So does she still count? Because it was my understanding that you could have two council persons and the mayor because they don't vote. 
Well, you can, but you take the risk that uh, she may disqualify herself from voting on, a, on an issue if one council member were absent and the issue came up and you had to make a decision. And you, you've, essentially, you're the third council person for that. It's called a six-member council form of government. And each one of you are council members. One is restricted to controlling the meetings, and but you at the same time are able to vote in the event of a tie. So I'd stay away from three of you getting together. So Okay. Thank you, Gary. We appreciate that training moment. <laughs> we'll move on to item number three, which is a presentation by Steve Jackson regarding the uh, precast wall of, for Gordon Avenue. Mayor and Council, it's good to good to be with you tonight. Um, I guess I'm sorry I'm hitting the power button here, the volume button. Um, just wanted to to kind of give a brief overview of the the Gordon Avenue wall that uh, was approved to be constructed in the last council meeting on October 15th. Um, as as many of you know, the the Gordon Avenue project is being completed with the US 89. Um, project and the extension of that roadway has been um, included as part of the the US 89 project uh, it's been in the the works for years here in Layton City and and as part of that project we have um, proposed to build a wall on the north side of Gordon Avenue um, from approximately 2030 east all the way to 2575 east in the in the existing developed areas to help with some of the mitigation that this new road will will potentially have on the, the residents there. So um, just wanted to, to go over briefly the, the bid that was received by ADC Corporation. They're the same company that has uh, constructed and installed the wall uh, along Leighton Parkway that you see um, as you drive down that roadway. Um, every one of the bid items here is is a, a an, not an estimate, but a, an approximation because the, the location of the wall had not been determined. Uh, at the time that we were requesting the bids, but the uh, necessity kind of presented itself a little bit earlier than we anticipated. As UDOT was completing this 89 project, they accelerated the construction of Gordon Avenue because they were restricted in some of the areas that they had proposed to build this summer. And, and so Gordon Avenue was not programmed to be done until next summer, and, and they've actually accelerated it quite a bit. So we're playing a little bit of catch up, but we're we're happy that UDOT has partnered with us and, and made this possible. So um, every one of the bid items here is is in this bid so that we can um, proceed with the, the construction. Uh, we've, we've got some locations where the wall has been reduced in length because of uh, some conditions with site distance and other uh, easements and things. But um, as we go through the bid, uh, you could see that the total bid was uh, about $350,000. And, and as we, we look at the items, if, if we need to add an additional column, that, there's a bid item for that. So we would just go through each line item and, and add or subtract. It's very common for our uh, bids to, to end up that way. And, and overall, if there's a, an issue with the amount that's been budgeted, then we would bring that back to Alex and, and discuss how we need to cover that through either a budget amendment or a budget transfer. Uh, of some kind. So um, part of the, the project is is to construct this wall. It's about 3,000 feet of eight inch, or excuse me, eight foot tall precast wall. Um, and, and like I mentioned, it would be on the north side of Gordon Avenue. Um, as you can see in this map that was attached with the previous um, packet from the council meeting, the the areas, if I can scroll out here just a little bit more, um, the areas in blue and green are proposed to have the wall on the north side. The areas in pink are, are adjacent to open fields and undeveloped land, and so the proposal is not to install the walls in those locations until development occurs. Um, the, the wall on Leighton Parkway consists of three-foot sections that drop down at the intersections. Uh, this particular location, because of the grades and the site distances that we're, we're dealing with, we've chosen to eliminate those three-foot sections of wall in order to remain uh, compliant with the site distance requirements and the safety of, of the roadway that we need to have. So the road 
the walls will will start, but they will start away from those intersections. Uh, a couple of places to um, take note of is at um, the the cottages at Valley View subdivision. Um, there is a, a petroleum gas line that runs through the city, and and at this location we we cannot put the wall inside that easement, so the wall will start a little bit further back, but it will. Um, cover the backyard of, of this home at 2158 uh, East. So uh, a second item to, to make note of is, as we've talked to the property owners, um, the only house that fronts or, or has their front of their, their house facing Gordon Avenue is, is this one at 2123. This property owner has requested that we not install a wall across their front yard so that they don't you know, have that impact of, of the wall there. They're well aware that there will be traffic on the road, but they have asked for that. And since we are not installing the wall across this section of, of field, uh, we felt like that was a reasonable request. And they, they've agreed to sign a letter stating that they, they are petitioning not to have the wall on that property. Um, and then as we go further east here, uh, we'll, we'll install the wall up to, to the UDOT property. And then as UDOT chooses what they do with their property in the future there will be a, an extension of that wall into um, the the frontage road to the east there so there is one section that in the bid includes a retaining wall at Lincoln Adams property at uh, 2154 in this area there's some substantial grade changes that need to happen and so we've we've programmed in a, a wall a retaining wall that then will have this decorative wall on top of it uh, that wall will be anywhere from four to six feet tall in that area. Um, so aesthetically in the bid package, there were three photos that were provided or, or in the council packet from last week or, or last time. And, and so this is the gray base option that we have um, discussed with the contractor. The gray base will is a little bit different than our Leighton Parkway wall that has the beige or tan color on it. Um, this gray will, will blend and match better with what UDOT is doing aesthetically on Highway 89. So we felt like that was a, a better choice for this section of the wall. And then this retaining wall is a two foot by four foot block um, that, that we propose to be constructed there so that it kind of matches the same uh, proportions of the, the wall that's being proposed. Um, the, the question that, that needs to be answered by uh, you as the council is, there's some accent choices that we have um, that they've proposed. One is the, the, all three of them have the gray base, but there is a beige accent and I'll try and zoom in on this. It's a little bit difficult to see that beige color. It's the same beige accent color that is in Leighton Parkway, but you can see a little bit of uh, those beige accent colors in the, um, in that wall. Or there is the option that at no additional cost to, to put in the beige accent with a darker gray accent, which really kind of, I think, makes the, the wall a really nice aesthetic uh, feature for for this. So as a, as a uh, matter of consistency, the wall will, will have whatever accent or whatever feature you would like on the side that faces Gordon Avenue. Um, on the back side of the wall against the homes, we have told the, the property owners that we can either leave it with just the base gray color um, the sealant basically that will help protect the concrete or they can choose whatever accent that the council chooses to to put on the other side of the wall um, since the since the last council meeting the contractor has completed all of the, the paperwork so the insurance and the bonds and the, the contract documents to be able to, to get started on this project um, they've also started ordering the material for the wall, the, the, the steel I-beams, and, and also getting the concrete uh, into to production. There's a, there's a concrete shortage going on. If, if you haven't heard, um, even the 89 project is dealing with some, some shortage of concrete supplies. So um, we've been fortunate that the contractor has been able to jump on this and start the production of these panels. There's approximately 200 panels that need to be manufactured for our, our section of wall, um, as well as um, just the, the general preparations that need to happen to mobilize onto the site. We've worked with UDOT to uh, find a place for them to actually stage and work so they can, they can be close to the site as they, they finish these, these walls up. And then um, as, as a matter of the, 
the process from, from our staff at the city. Uh, my assistant, Alan McCain, has been um, instrumental in, in talking to every single homeowner, contacting them directly, meeting with them on site to make sure that any site concerns are addressed, any concerns that the homeowners might have um, can be uh, taken into consideration as we move forward and then also coordinating the final location and designs of these walls with the site distances. So um, one of the other items that you should be aware of is there's been a couple of homeowners who have requested that this wall only be six feet in height. Um, we have discussed that internally as staff and we, we recommend that we remain at the eight foot height for consistency, uh, functionality. Obviously the wall is, is not 100% designed to be a sound wall, but it will act as a sound wall in these locations. and. And, and dropping that height will will uh, not give it the same look or appearance and consistency along this whole corridor, but it will also uh, not function as well as a, as a noise barrier or, or a visual barrier to the, to the roadway. So um, with that, if there's any questions I can answer, I'd be happy to. And then if I could get an opinion from, from the council on which accent or, or which color scheme they would like to go with and uh, we can go from there so so yeah go so ahead. have the citizens been generally accepting of it then yes every every one of them is is accepting of the wall um, apart from a few that want the six foot height everybody is is really happy that the wall is going in it's been long awaited and and they've been asking about it ever since they saw the road construction happening and and we're trying to to kind of meet our end of the, the the communication we've had, which is we want to make sure that the wall goes in before we see all of the traffic that will potentially come from having a new interchange up there on, on 89 and Gordon. So, And then uh, I, strictly on the north side, yeah, the it's, Ovation it's, Homes, where there are vinyl fences, that'll just stay the way it is? Yeah, that'll stay the way it is. That's very similar to the way that Roberts Farms is down in on Layton Parkway over by Kennington. Um, the subdivision down there west of Angel Street, there's there's a vinyl fence on the south side. Um, a couple of reasons for that, the, the fence is, is already installed and it's <coughs> it's uh, against the landscape buffer. So they have a they have a 10 foot trail with a five foot, um, let me see if I can find the, the cross section here. There's, there's a 10 foot trail with a five foot landscape buffer and then five feet behind that as well. So there's a 20 foot buffer on that south side of the road. The homes on the Ovation subdivision actually sit a little bit lower than Gordon Avenue, where most of these uh, homes on the north side sit a little bit higher than Gordon Avenue. So uh, we've, we've chosen to only put the wall on this north side. And then my other question is the staining on it, is that when they cast it or is that after? No, it's after. So they will, they will cast them and stand them up and then they come back in and paint them and, and seal them so, so we have a little bit of time to make a decision, but, but we'd like to know sooner than later um, if, if these are an acceptable color scheme to, to the council. Okay, and lastly, my vote is for the last one, that one. The, the dual, <laughs> the, the dual accent, color. The, double, yeah. the double color accent. You say it accent. doesn't cause any extra for that? No, they, they confirmed with us. This is the, uh, essentially it's the same accent treatment that the Layton Parkway wall has with just a, a different color scheme. So that's a stain that actually sinks in the concrete, doesn't flake off, doesn't yeah. peel off or anything. Yeah, it's uh, and and there will be a gray. Even though the concrete is gray, there's a gray base coat that they put on as well to help seal and protect the concrete. Okay, well, in, that's in my addition, vote. so okay. do they? Thank you. Is there like a a mow strip underneath it, or just so you're going to have? Undulation in the. Or no, we'll, there will be places like this where where it will um, be left, and you'll maybe have a two two inch one one to three inch gap underneath it, possibly. But but we will come back in as part of our our landscaping and probably fill those in as needed. So that we won't have the holes underneath. Yeah, it. they're, they're, it's not intended to have holes okay. everywhere underneath it. Okay. No. Um, Steve, the yeah. second picture shows a tan retaining wall. I, I don't care if it's one or three, but I would really hope that the retaining wall is like the first picture, that it's the gray. No, this this is the actual okay. picture of that block okay. wall. Yeah, this this one is a keystone wall. We chose not to use that because it's proportionally not quite as aesthetically pleasing as this other wall is. It, 
obviously we'll cover the same area that needs to be retained, but but we felt like proportionally that that wall is the color and the the choice that we want to go with. So, anybody else want to weigh in? Well, I'm with Tom. I like to where they come in after and paint the make it look like they're separate. That so right there, yeah. You would prefer this double accent yeah. color uh -huh. than okay. And that's what we have on the parkway right now, right? Right. Yeah, we have a double accent on the parkway just with a little bit well, different uh, shading. I know I, you have the one side. They, people don't let me in their backyard. So it, it is on both sides on the parkway. And one of the one of the maybe only negative things we've heard about the wall on the parkway is that a lot of homeowners felt like they didn't want the accent colors because it didn't blend with their blend home with colors their, and their, their aesthetics in their backyard. And so we felt like giving them the choice between either the the base only color or the accent would would help with that and can they paint it yeah they can i mean we we're not going to go back in there and police them if they want to choose to paint it but yeah i mean but yeah it, it, there wouldn't be any kind of warranty from the 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 wall company to come in and take care of any yeah. colors they chose to put back there so so steve i have one quick question yeah on the home that actually faces gordon at, there towards the east side the, the single home and they are willing to sign a letter stating that they do not want the wall um can you will you verify or make sure that the verbiage is in there that that transfers with ownership should they sell yeah, yeah our uh, gary gary's team is working on that with us to make sure that that is very clear that it will be recorded against the property that if they sell then then the future property owners cannot come in and request that the city install the wall for them okay. Well, for what it's worth, I'm in favor of the third one as well. I like the multicolor. And then, Steve, when I met with an you, an opinion. When I met with you before, Steve, we talked about the where there's already vinyl fence, and that those are coming down, correct? Yeah. The, the proposal. Up. The proposal is that there are there are three homes at uh, about 20, 2150 in this area. There's the, the three homes here. They have a, a six foot vinyl fence right here, and in order to maintain that aesthetic and also the consistency uh, uh, that we're trying to, to have, but also the, the noise abatement. The eight-foot wall is proposed to go across the back of all four of those properties. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the couple of homeowners are, are on this west end. They're the two that have, have really wanted the six-foot wall. We've, we've tried to explain why we think the eight-foot is the better decision, and that's where the city is, where the staff is. So. Um, that that's what we're recommending that we keep maintaining um, the just as a point of uh, maybe interest for you all they're going to start right here at the 2158 um, East house that's they, they need to work uphill and and where the western four homes back on the Oak Ridge Circle are not quite ready for the wall because you still doing some work they're going to start right here at 2158 and work east and then they'll have to build the retaining wall and and kind of proceed west to east on this project so so steve right straight south of that where that proposed senior center is what will happen there on that side then there won't um, be a wall there won't be a wall on that south side no it'll whatever even once it develops yeah once well i guess if if the senior center wants to to put in the wall or something we could discuss that but but right now the wall is only proposed on that north side so there would be no requirement for them to do it there Necessarily, um, yeah, it's oh. probably a question for maybe Chad and his group with fencing. I don't know that we would require a fence along the frontage of a of a more kind of residential commercial use that you know of. So, sorry, I, I don't mean to. Well, well, while he's looking that up, that begs the question. Then, as this road continues to develop going west, are you, do you foresee it the wall only being on the north side and never the south side, or? Because, I mean, if it's a noise barrier. Pretty much golf course, isn't it? You know. It, yeah, the, to well, the south here. It opens up down below, though. Um, be, because, the, because any of the properties to the south are, are lower than the road, the, the, the reality is, is that those fences don't necessarily work as much as a noise abatement as, as they or maybe a visual block of the road. So um, it's not to say it can't happen, but but right now we're only planning it on the north side, and then depending on how the the properties to the west develop, we would make that decision at that time. I'll I'll let Chad talk to that that question about maybe possible fence along that 
So the code, the, the way the code reads is that that's a requirement on these arterial collector streets when it's when it's an R1, R2 zone. I'm not, I think this is, was zoned a different yeah, it's, district. Maybe Tim can even chime in on what that zoning was put in place there on that property. But it's, it, you know, with that different zoning, that wouldn't be a requirement. It, and in reality, if it's really a, a standard for when lots have double frontage, um, this one in this case, it's kind of a corner lot rather than a double fronting lot. Um, double frontage means you have a front on one side and a rear on the other side. Corner lots when you have frontage on two streets. So, you know, the, the, with that different zoning and the the uh, just the commercial residential nature of it, I, this is not going to be a requirement. I th can you see what that zone is on there, Tim? Do you have the zoning map? I've got I've got the controls here. Maybe I'll. Oh yeah. Excuse okay. me. And, and maybe just another point of clarification while Tim's looking that up. Um, the the trail is being constructed all the way to the west to the Andy Adams Reservoir um, trailhead parking that is that is down there right now. So so there will be a 10 foot asphalt trail all the way across that that property as well. That then will have a landscape buffer and, and items on it. Is that on the south? Or the it's on the south side, south yeah. Side. The, the, the trail is is all the way, is on the south side. It will run all the way from the Andy Adams um, trailhead or, or parking area down there all the way to the east to the frontage road um, at, uh, at Gordon Avenue there. The blue it's one. It's zone there. PB. So that, that's a different zone. That, those standards for those um, walls and fences along arterial and collector streets wouldn't apply to that property. All right. Thanks. So so it sounds like maybe there's a consensus to go with the double accent colors. So we'll we'll move forward with that. And then, uh, uh, like I say, the contractor's planning to mobilize next week. So we'll hopefully see some some things going on up there and, and it'll be exciting to watch. So just, I, I don't know if I missed it, but the homeowner has the ability to say yay or nay to the to the accent, to the color. accent. yeah yeah, yeah. And, and, and alan has already discussed okay. that with each one of them okay. as he met and um wanted to make sure that they were were all aware of what kind of impacts there would be um you know how we can tie back the existing fences mm -hmm. that are there on the sides and and all of those things so i think we're well on our way to get this moving and, and get it taken care of so okay thank you thank you Okay, next up will be uh, Joellen Grandy, or Grady. Oh. Um, she's actually going to take the next two items, and then uh, Mr. Price will be up after that. Well, hello, thank you so much. We're excited to be here. Um, I will move quickly because I know there's a lot to be talking about in other topics as well, but um, we've been very busy in the Parks and Rec Department. Um, we're excited about these projects. Um, so we have two resolu resolutions that we will be sharing with you today about firm selections that we're, we've been working on. Uh, this first one is for the, the future Harmony Place Park site, which is located at 2525 West. 100 South in, in Layton. Uh, it's over there in the Harmony um, Perry Homes development PRUD area. Um, we have, uh, we had a, an RFP issued out and uh, we had 10 different firms who responded to our RFP. Uh, we provided an opportunity for each one of them to be able to be interviewed and to present um, their RFP package. We had a panel of seven different um, jury members on the team. It was a mix of uh, city staff from the Parks and Rec Department. We had some Parks and Rec Commission members on that as well as um, council members and our mayor as well. So um, each of these firms that had submitted, we uh, did scoring for them. There, they were 
divided up into two sections, basically. There was a scoring of 70 points based on judging on their, their skill level, and then the, the rest of the 30 points was assigned to their fee proposals. Um, just quickly, we ran through each one of those firms. Um, we had a, a proposed fee range from the lowest being $68,800 to the high range of $130,240 for design services. Uh, we identified Design West Architects, a fee of $70,855 um, with a score of 29.1 out of 30, uh, along with their, their other technical fee score equaling 90 points out of 100, and they were identified as our um, top firm that we would like to hire at this time. Um, I will go to the next one if that's all right, and then maybe at the end if there's any questions we can circle back. The second resolution is with regards to the Ellison Park Pickleball Complex firm selection. Um, this is to do an eight-court pickleball complex there that on the east side of Ellison Park next to Cold Creek Way. In a similar manner, we had this RFP issued out. We had 11 firms that responded to the RFP, and we also gave them the opportunity to be uh, interviewed and to present. Um, we also had a, a jury of seven people there um, to help with scoring. Um, as we evaluated all of the proposals, um, we identified Design West Architects also as the as the high scorer. They had a proposal score of 60.9 and a fee score of 29.1, which gave them a, a, a total score of 90 points out of 100. Their, their, their fee was $70,855. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm on the, other, on the first one. Uh, I apologize. Thanks. <laughs> Oh dear. Okay. So Design West Architects fee was just twenty nine thousand dollars six hundred and twenty twenty nine thousand six hundred and twenty dollars. I don't say that money very often, so that's why. <laughs> um, so I apologize about that. Their proposal score was sixty seven point nine and their fee score was their fee score was thirty. So they came to a point of ninety seven point nine out of a hundred and so they also have been identified as the as the team that we would like to hire at this time. Um, with that, uh, I will open it up to any questions that you may have. Just a kind of more of a comment, um, especially on the Sunburst Park. I think it was so great what you guys did with the residents out there. Um, as this design company starts designing this, will they take those comments from the residents? Yes, we will be providing all of those comments. They'll, they'll be scanned and shared with them. Um, and so they'll be able to review those as well. And really curious, do the little kids come up with anything of real value? Oh, they love, they had a lot of good comments about the playground, which I think will be very helpful um, because that's what they, they really love. So we'll definitely highlight that to our designers, let them know about them. Excited for it. Just a, a general question. How do we come up with the names for the parks? That usually occurs at the very end, and um, I believe it's you guys. Okay. <laughs> so we could have the Dave Thomas Memorial Park. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, just, just, just with that, that's true. Um, you guys will have the final say, but I know in the past, often the parks have kind of inherited the name, which kind of associated with their the development that's nearby. But um, it's definitely open to whatever you guys would like to call it. Okay. Thank you. So, what about the Andy Adams um, courts? Are they separate, or are you guys just taking care of those, or? <laughs> Yeah, there, we're, we've got a, a construction documents prepared for that, and, and we're hoping to put those out to bid this this fall so we can get ourselves queued up, ready to go first thing for spring. So, Okay, so separate. you guys just took care of that all in-house? In the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, they listened to what we said on the uh, two meetings ago, or back when they, we gave them their marching orders. <laughs> we will be bringing that back to council when the uh, construction numbers come in. Any other questions? 
I just have one on an unrelated topic, but since I have the Parks and Rec people here, I have had multiple questions regarding the walking track at Shoreline. Is it open and will it be opened in the near future if not? Um, it is open now and uh, the gym is open. We're doing pickleball. Well, not pickleball. We moved pickleball to Legacy. Um, mm -hmm. But we are having some of our athletic programs, basketball and, and volleyball down there. And then that gym is open for their use in the evenings. You know, the hours? The track Same and hours? the exercise equipment as well. Oh, okay. And do you know what the hours are? No, I don't. I mean, it will find it. That's why I'm asking. I, I believe it's um, it should be right about 5 o'clock is when we take control of that gym. So that's typically when we start our programs. And then we have committed to keep that open until 10. Okay. And it's a, the fee is still being charged for just the use of the track, correct? It is. They can come into the office. Um, they can purchase a punch pass, or I'm sorry, a, a, a monthly pass where they can do a punch pass also. It's quite, you know, a, a wonderful rate for the facility that you have. It's, it's simply, I think, of a dollar. If you buy a punch pass, a dollar uh, at any meeting. Sorry, that, visit. Yeah, that this is off topic, but with the COVID going on and if you have opened up the equipment, is somebody there cleaning that constantly like they are supposed to be in gyms? We do. We have a, a person at these gyms each evening that not only monitors the activities that are going on, but they're cleaning and uh, uh, supervising our, our staff. Okay, there. great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on those two topics? Very good. We get to move on. Very You're good. at the podium already, so go ahead and uh, talk about the Betterman Agreement. Um, we are, if I might add, thrilled to have Design West on board. Uh, they are one of the most stable firms around. They've been in business for 125 years um, as a design firm out of Logan and a real good team. So we're, we're happy to have them involved. So uh, this evening I have the pleasure of introducing Resolution 60 or 2065. This evening I have the resolution or the privilege of introducing Resolution 2065, which is a betterment agreement between the Utah Department of Transportation and Layton City for the Case Creek pedestrian box culvert to be constructed within the scope of the U.S. Highway 89 Farmington to 184 in Davis and Weber counties. Um, as we've shown you this before, I think you're familiar with what we're looking at. This is a sample of a box culvert very similar to what we're looking at. Um, this one is up in Park City. The location um, that we're looking at is right at the bottom of your screen there, um, I wish I had a pointer, right where the dotted line is. Um, that's the, the position that this, or the location of this underpass. This is, uh, shows and demonstrates how it connects to our trails around the area. And it also demonstrates an important aspect that that connection or the interchange on the north there does not have a pedestrian crossing. And so this will become the closest and most safe and effective way to get people from the east to the west and west to east. Um, this demonstrates the uh, closer view of the location and how it, it will connect to our trails. Um, the culvert is one aspect of this project. And so it's important that you understand this evening that there's two components to this. The first one is the UDOT Betterment Agreement, and that has a distinct price tag with it. The second one that we'll talk about is the trail connections that are that need to be associated. And so the UDOT Betterment is strictly within inside their construction limits. The second component of this project that we'll talk with you about is from the the UDOT project through to our trails. And so we'll need to have trails that connect to this culvert to make it you know, effective. 
and so we'll, we'll talk about both of those. Um, this demonstrates our financial plan for this project. The uh, blue uh, header there is for the UDOP betterment agreement. And as you can see, the cost on that is $1,089,450. This also demonstrates the funding strategy that we've been working on for multiple years now. The green uh, indicates secured monies that we've received from outside agencies and, and our Layton City Prop 1. Um, the, the two red ones there are ones that we're looking forward to in this next year's budget. Um, as you can see, one is a Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant that we have already received once, but it timed out, and they have indicated that they're still willing to fund this, but they would like us to resubmit. Um, and so we feel very good about that one. So that, that is the dollar amount we're talking about with the betterment. The other component will come later, and that is the trails that connect to this underpass. This um, dollar amount you see there is $709,605. This is an estimate at best. It is a conservative estimate based on some UDOT designs and costing. We, if we move ahead with this project, we will go out and hire our own engineer to do this work. We believe that we have looked at some cost-saving measures that will be able to bring this down, but we wanted to bring it to you in its, you know, its rough form. Um, we believe that this number can come down in the future through some creative design work and shortening of the trails, but you know, in case that doesn't happen, we wanted to be honest with you and, and demonstrate what you're looking at financially. Um, again, this also demonstrates how we plan to pay for this. Um, we feel very comfortable with these things. Uh, we did receive a, an email on the $395,000 grant that they feel that we are um, in line to be awarded that. They just have to walk through the process. And so that's a, a good grant that we'll receive in the future. Joellen has been extremely um, diligent about searching out these grant opportunities and about uh, acquiring the money. And so that's been a great thing. We will continue to do that to lessen the burden on the city. But this is a, a financially, this is a large project. And we want you to know exactly where we at are, where we are financially on it, and hope that you feel like we do, that this underpass is an important um, connection for our city, for trails, um, safe routes to schools, and biking and hiking. Um, we are building this not for this next year. We are looking to build this for the future of Layton. So, do you have any questions? Yeah. I didn't see, but it's a drawing or a picture of another one. Are there lights in it? There will be, yes. Okay. That's I was just saying, it's awful dark. Yeah. Especially now, you know, five, six o'clock, so. No, we're working with you, Dot, to make sure that that happens. Okay. So my question is on the connection, the trail connections and stuff that you showed on your map. Um, and maybe it's too early, but do you foresee any problems with getting right away through some of those properties or? At, on the east side, it's on the, the right side of the drawing there. That one, the if we move to the the south or down screen, uh, that is private property. That's one of the things we're looking at design-wise. We'd like to turn that trail and move directly to the north, and stay on UDOT property. And if we can do that, which we believe we can, we will reduce the need for that taking of property or the acquiring of property. And what about the one going west that showed down towards Hobbs Reservoir? Yeah, that one is on UDOT property. Um, and we, we don't anticipate any need for additional property there. The one that shows all the way down to the lake? No, no, the one that goes to the sidewalk there by that yeah, home. Yeah, the, the one on this picture. Yeah, the, the next section is just to connect uh, the underpass to the sidewalks and to the, to the nearest pathway. The, the trails that go down to Hobbs Creek 
would have to be a different project. That's not included in this project. Then. That, that is okay. not included. You're talking the more bolder yellow dashes, not the little ones. Yes. Okay. Could you go back one more, Dave? Oh, back. Yep. Oop, right there. I'd, I had uh, shared this and, and had some folks reach out up where it says proposed Case Creek Trail connection, the green. Those green dots. Yes. That group of citizens were concerned. I know Joe Ellen, she, she responded and said, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure. But if, if that's something that we decide to, or we want to look at that will involve them and, and have that discussion and have that not just happen, just uh, I'm sorry, Glenn. I, I'm, so you got the homeowners. Uh, yeah, the homeowners there because that'll be in their backyard. For at least that's the that's the uh, concern. And so if that if we do that, then we'll. I'm, I'm assuming we'll have some public input. They'll be able to <laughs> have some input on that. We we will have public input on that, but we also are on a different property. We're not in their backyard. No, I understand that. There was just concern about having the trail there and having people there and having, and as I, you know, I sent that email to to, to you and Joellen, and she was like, "Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, did, we, that's just our we'll be good neighbors. Is what we'll be good neighbors. That's the but would love to have if if we if we decide to do that. I just don't want that just to happen. Let's let them know what's going on and not surprise them. And it it will happen most likely um, as development occurs on that property. And so there will be options as that property um, moves forward in the future. We've attempted to talk with the property owner right now and, and they just are not interested at this point because of the possibility of future development. Sure. Um, we, we don't know exactly what they'll choose to do as a family, but we'll work with them either way. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Council? No? Very good. Thank that you. Was good for both of you guys. Thank you. You're not leaving without a cookie either. What's that? Because you're not leaving without a cookie. Oh. <laughs> I'm usually good for cookies. There, awesome. While, they're, while we're uh, getting ready for Chad to come up, he's gonna he's got the next two items. Um, I'm going to pass the tray. Actually, I'll carry it on here. I'm going to go ahead and just jump in, Mayor, if that's okay, since we're limited on time. Um, we, we, uh, we've got two items scheduled. One of the items is also on your regular agenda, so we'll probably spend, if, if it's all right with the council, spend the majority of our time talking about the item that's not on our regular agenda, which is a proposed amendment uh, that's been reviewed by our Planning Commission. It's an amendment to change some of the land uses in the mixed-use uh, zones or mixed-use, mixed-use TOD zones to provide some additional flexibility um, particularly related to mixed-use development. Um, a, a recent mixed-use development applicant came forward and asked if there was a way that we could consider uh, with the changes to um, market conditions, with recent changes to, to office and, and retail um, trends that we've seen, partially before COVID, but also some, some since COVID has, has occurred, um, in order to provide some additional flexibility for some of these um, these mixed-use developments. One of the things they've identified is that some of these buildings um, could be appropriate for small-scale, light industrial, light manufacturing uses um, that would be clean, low noise, kind of maker spaces is what they call those sometimes. These are these are small entrepreneurial spaces that offer some flexibility for someone to have a larger area to do some of that, that either distribution or uh, small light manufacturing. So we've taken a look at that and uh, we're, we're gonna talk about some of those uh, potential uses that could be added to those use tables and also some restrictions that we would place on there to try to try to mitigate any uh, potential concerns with uh, you know the, with a mixed use zone you're gonna have residential potentially right above or to the side so we want to make sure we're we're mitigating those uses one other thing that Tim's going to talk about very briefly is our Planning Commission has been asking us for a long time to look at this table of uses related to what should be conditional or permitted uses and so that is also part of this amendment um, while we were in the land use table, we thought that was a good time for us to look at those and uh, respond to something that's been asked for us, asked by for us for a long time. So, ask 
yeah, I, I know I'm not saying that right, but I'm going to go on. So I'm going to turn the, t the time on, or the time to Tim and let him talk about that. <laughs> Thank you, and good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, what Chad has just described is actually recommended in our general plan that mixed use areas can include smaller scale light industrial uses for maker spaces or clean manufacturing. Just a couple of examples of the type of inquiries we can receive. Uh, here's a property, 1550 West Hillfield Road, where we've recently had an inquiry about a small scale salad dressing manufacturer, operate blenders and mix ingredients together. Also a bath and beauty product manufacturer. Uh, this property is built for kind of flex retail and, and a variety of commercial uses, yet the zoning, which is a commercial highway, does not allow for these uses. And so we see this as benefiting um, not just mixed use, mixed use TOD, but um, we've tried to look comprehensively, holistically at the code. Here's an example of a UMass uh, facility. It's a multi-story office building, but inside they build uh, uh, within the middle of kind of conference and office areas, collaborating workspaces, they have this maker space. This is more on the high tech, but they have a variety of machines and 3D printing and laser cutting. So this is an example of a insulated walled off area that shows this is a compatible use with surrounding office uses. And here's the surrounding office and conference and collaborative workspaces. So um, four general areas that I'll briefly outline for you, they're addressed in this uh, recommended text amendment to expand the MU and MU TOD areas with standards and limitations. We don't just want to change the the allowed uses without looking carefully at uh, potential limitations and development standards. Um, and then to also review non-residential and residential uses. We've seen opportunities to, uh, that I'll share in just a moment, to add and clarify institutional res residential uses and then to consolidate and update manufacturing and commercial uses. Um, assisted living is an example of a, a use that uh, is not in our code. We have some similar uses, but this is uh, a need and an opportunity to add this use to our code. Community center um, is an existing use. We felt that a new definition or an, a definition would be useful and helpful. Um, so here is assisted living uh, that would then be um, also adding our condo townhouse zone district, which is not currently in our zoning table. So we think it's a good opportunity to add that. Uh, community center, just moving it from residential to the institutional civic and um, the assisted living. Uh, so this is the residential table. This is the non-residential table. And so uh, we're just kind of continuing these uses into both of those tables. Here's a new use. Uh, Chad mentioned new trends in commercial. And one of those is uh, kind of a shift in retail, that in some cases we see very strong viable retail locations, brick and mortar, but uh, sometimes they're looking for the flexibility to sell online as well as have a retail presence. And so here in the lower left you see a fulfillment area, kind of the warehouse, fulfillment in the back, with a retail presence in the front. So this is a new use with a new definition, and then standards added for this use uh, that basically require visibility from street into finished office and um, conference areas, retail areas. Um, and then if there is warehouse area exposed by windows, that that would be screened with a portion of graphics and uh, wall displays. There's another proposed existing, uh, de proposed definition for an existing use, which is the indoor commercial amusement. And then, uh, the light commercial flex manufacturing. This is essentially the maker space. And um, what we shared examples of uh, early in the, the presentation. And uh, how we define this is that when operated, the instruments and machines are not to an exceed, not to exceed a noise level greater than 85 decibels. And that's basically a really good pet vacuum might start to reach about 85 decibels or a lighter side um, shop vac, also a busy restaurant. And if these uses were proposing to operate equipment or machines louder than that 85 decibels, then they should mitigate by increased sound attenuation. The manufacturing and industrial services, which is the, the more typical side of manufacturing that we see, these would uh, be the, continue to be allowed in uh, the manufacturing light and heavy uh, districts. Um, in the table, the current land use table, we have many different specific 
manufacturing uses, and we're proposing to consolidate them, uh, reduce that redundancy, and put it into a consolidated definition. And these can operate above 85 decibels, but still looking to make sure that they don't uh, extend impacts beyond the ambient level um, and, or desirable level beyond the property boundaries. This just shows the. this is a diagram of uh, noise decibels. You see the louder decibels above 85, which would be allowed in the manufacturing industrial uses, but this light commercial flex manufacturing would be the, the lighter um, noise decibels is there, or lower. Is there a time on these things? In some zones, there would be time limits, yes. I mean, 85 is loud. Okay, no matter what you say, 85 is loud if you're trying to sleep. Absolutely. Time you know, is a, a great if comment. In the middle of the day, it's a little different. Especially in mixed-use zones, if we're looking yeah. at mixing residential. Right, if you're uses, mixing residential. That's a very if good If you're comment. not, it doesn't matter. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so here's a, an example of... of where light manufacturing, uh, which is this top proposed uh, use, and how it could fit into the land use table. You notice a limitation two for mixed use and mixed use um, transitorian development, and then a limitation one in some of these other zones. And these have to do with the scale or the size. So there's not a limitation in the M1 and M2, but in MU, MUTOD, and um, CP1, or excuse me, in, in, in MU, MU, TOD, the, the size would be limited to 6,000 square feet. Other areas uh, limited to 15,000 square feet. And that's just to keep the volume of the, the trucks and so forth and box trucks coming in and out uh, at a kind of a moderate level, a manageable level. Um, outdoor storage in the M1, M2 table. The, these are examples of the other industrial and related uses that would remain in our uh, land use table. Uh, changing outdoor storage, which is only allowed in M1 and M2 to permitted use. We have some good standards in place to screen and um, fit those appropriately into the manufacturing districts. Well, here's an example of uh, limiting retail into our manufacturing areas, keeping uh, the majority of the use for manufacturing, but allowing some retail. And then another new uh, proposed use is office and indoor storage. This would not be allowed in MUTOD, only the, the mixed use and, and some other commercial zones. But this allows for a nice finished office presence in the front with storage in the back. And this can support various types of mobile services. And again, provide the flexibility to, to bring some uh, additional commercial spaces into these zones. And uh, let's see, retail sales and commercial services. This is, a, again, a consolidation of the many redundant uh, types of commercial uses that we have in our table, they would be consolidated into the retail and commercial services. And it's just a, the typical type of retail and services that we see in our community. Uh, proposed as a new land use table, these are the limitations. I mentioned the 15,000 square foot maximum and the 6,000 square foot maximum is the limitation two. Limitation three would be that some uses are not permitted directly beneath or below multifamily residential in the MU and MUTOD. And then limitation four uh, relates to this table that I just shared, that there would be a limited percentage of a building that could be allowed as retail, the majority for either manufacturing or uh, business research part. And so here's just some examples of the limitations in the table, uh, how they can apply. Again, limitation two is the uh, limiting uh, to 6,000 square feet, applicable especially to MU, MU2D, and CP1. Uh, limitation four, these are some of the, the uses what, that are limited in the manufacturing and the business research park zones. Uh, an example of limitation four, which is to not, not allow a use directly beneath residential, would be, say, a music store. Um, I think we have a pet store on here somewhere, or a pet shop. So you couldn't have that directly beneath. So uh, also some standards in the MU and MUTOD uh, help to, um, as you mentioned, uh, Councilman Thomas, limiting the hours, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Some of these uses, uh, again, just trying to assure compatibility and uh, also making sure that drive-throughs in these walkable areas don't occur between a building and the public street. So this is just a quick overview of the various types of standards. Uh, happy to take any questions and um, 
appreciate your, your review of this item. Well, Mr. Wilkinson's given me the opportunity to come in for a visit, so you know me, I will be. Um, but just one right offhand that maybe you could answer here, and it has to do with the truck loading. It talks about the truck loading shall not occur, or it must occur in the rear or side of a building. What if the side of that building is adjacent to a major street? Uh, well, or the rear is adjacent to a street. And I want to take the DABC building and Layton as part of it. That is a, the truck is unloaded technically in the rear of that building on a street that has, then it's an issue of pedestrian access because the trucks overhang. So is, is there some other consideration that needs to be given to where these buildings are placed and pedestrian access so that these trucks do not unload in a feasible area of pedestrian I think it'd be walkways. good to look at that. Are you talking especially on corner lots or three-sided lots? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think we could look at that. And but I will make an appointment. Come in. I have some other questions, but I'm not going to tie the night up with that. Thank you. Okay, we have one more item to go over here quickly. We've got eight minutes left. and actually, I, I don't know that we could do that justice in eight minutes, Mayor, so we'd be happy to, that's on our regular agenda. We'd be happy to take yeah. take that question or take that item then. I will say that the offer that I made to uh, Councillor Fitzpatrick applies to anyone. If any of you'd like to come in and spend some time and talk specifically about this ordinance, we'd be happy to, or over the phone or whatever the case may be, we'd be happy to do that. So, okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, do you want to quickly go over uh, item number eight? Or just wait and do it at that meeting? I mean, you um, yeah, I don't, I mean, uh, we want to be sensitive to you as well. And I know it's good for you to have a little break between. So I, I don't know that we're going to be able to do it justice in just the, the little time that we have. So, I mean, we'd be happy to just talk about the regular meeting if that's. I'm good with waiting until the, okay. the regular meeting because that yeah. one will have quite a bit on it. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, we have seven minutes, but I did not get a chance to do my mayor's report. Tracy, do you think you could update us quickly? Okay, what I'd like to, what I wanted him to do, if you guys don't mind, he'll just take a couple of minutes here, but I thought it'd be appropriate that if we have an update here on where we're sitting on our uh, our COVID uh, dollars that we've received and how, how we're uh, spending those dollars or keeping track of the spend on those as well. Just I just thought it would be great to, for all you guys to get an update on that. So Tracy, take it away. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So we have five grants that have come in related to the CARES Act. Uh, the police department has spent most of theirs on appropriate equipment and so forth. CDBG, we were familiar with that. There were some business grants and things that have gone through. Uh, the HHS CARES Act was an EMS grant and they spent most of that on PPE and some specialized equipment that the CDC required to respond to CARES Act or to coronavirus. And then also our 911 dispatch received a grant and they've spent a bulk of that funding towards dispatch related items as it pertains to COVID-19. Uh, then there's the uh, CARES Act funding that's coming through the state that was directly from the CARES Act itself. Uh, the total on that to Layton City, 6.6 .6 million, just a little bit over that. And we've received all of those funds here at the city and we're tracking them. We have a couple of different project codes that are tracking direct expenses. And to date, uh, we've spent about 265,000 of that on PPE and time off for people that have had COVID and, and some other things as far as time for emergency responders and so forth. A couple of weeks ago, we received guidance from the Office of the Inspector General of the Treasury, which to me is ultimately the final decision maker as far as how this is going to be audited and so forth. And they gave very direct guidance to the fact that municipalities can use these funds to cover wages and benefits of frontline workers. And so with assuming that we will cover the wages and benefits of our frontline workers from July through December, we will more than spend the money that's been allotted to the city. And so that's what I have to report. Uh, if we hear something different from the state, then obviously I'll, I'll bring that back to you. The state is the primary recipient of the grant, mm -hmm. and we're a sub-recipient. Uh, prior to this, they had talked against that methodology, but that was 
also prior to the Office of the Inspector General indicating that this was this is the intended way the money is to be used, period. And he was pretty clear about it. I ran it by our, your independent auditors right. to make sure they were good with that, and they said that they were in 100% agreement, and so were all their other cities that they audit. So for now, that's going to be our recommendation. Thank you very much. I know it was good, and certainly we can have some more discussion on this, but... Uh, you can see why we were being ultra conservative on that until we knew exactly where we stood as far as the accountability. So right. with that, um, I think we're going to end our, our uh, work meeting so that the council can have a, a quick break here and then we'll reconvene at 7 p.m. for our council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone out to our city council meeting this evening. Uh, this is uh, November 5th, 2020 at 7.01 p.m. So welcome everyone. Uh, tonight we have an, uh, uh, an unusually large gathering, which typically we do not. I do know, I watched, and I know that you guys are practicing everything that his, the governor has explained to us as far as what we should do as far as social distancing as well as sanitizing and making sure that uh, you know you stay masked up the whole time so thank you for doing that um, and also I do know that I watched and you guys signed the paper for contact tracing so we appreciate that and um, with that I'm going to go ahead and get our uh, meeting started Mr. Morris are you Good to, it's November, are you going to do the prayer and pledge? Okay, sure. all right. Okay, so typically what we do with our council meetings is we have one of our council members kind of do our opening ceremony, which is a prayer and a pledge. And today it is council member uh, Clint Morris's turn, so I'll turn the time over to him. Yeah, if we can all rise and uh, follow me with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we come before thee as citizens of this great city of Layton City this evening, grateful for the peace and safety in which we find ourselves. We're grateful, Father, for those that help to protect the freedoms that we enjoy here in this country, and especially those that protect us and keep us safe, our first responders here in, in Layton City. We're grateful for them and for their families. We ask that that would please be with us this evening as we discuss the, the business of this city. Help us, bless us with wisdom and guidance as we make decisions and these things we ask and do so in the name of jesus christ amen amen thank you councilman okay council um we have uh, three uh, items of uh, minutes to uh, adopt so i'd look for a motion on that uh, Madam Mayor, I move that we approve minutes of Layton City Council strategic planning meeting, work meeting September 30th, 2020, uh, Layton City Council meeting October 1, 2020, and Layton City Council meeting October 15, 2020. Okay. Is there any second? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much. We're now at the point where we'll do our menu municipal, geez, this mass <laughs> municipal event announcements. Does Anyone here have any announcements? Okay, I have a few that I'll go ahead and make because I think it's appropriate. Um, first off, I want to acknowledge everybody that's here and I know why you're here and I don't want to spoil that because I, you know, it's dear, near and dear, but thank you. Um, coming up this, on November 11th, typically as well as you all know is Veterans Day. Uh, the city is, will be observing vet, Veterans Day. Traditionally, we've had a nice program where, public, where we can have the public involved. Unfortunately, with the COVID situation, we do not. But 
watch for a really nice tribute to be online that will be uh, our Parks and Rec folks have put together. So that, that will be on that day as well. Um, and then, as you know, we're celebrating our centennial year and we've had to cancel a lot of events. However, we are gonna start up our lecture series. And again, this is gonna be something that's gonna be done online, but starting our first one to restart up is gonna be on the 12th. And uh, we have Senator Stevenson that will be presenting that lecture series. So again, watch for that online. And these items, just so you know, it will be on our community calendar, but uh, they're just good events for us to kind of just understand your community and what's going on here. Um, and at this point, until otherwise we know otherwise, our turkey bowl is still on, and the registration on that will be on uh, November 16th. And just two more items, and then I promise I'll stop talking. <laughs> and that is, um, again on our calendar if you'd look on it's a saturday uh the there will be a dog vaccination so if you want to get your dog vaccinated for a pretty inexpensive price it's like eight dollars and uh you can also get a microchipped it's actually the davis county animal shelter is going to be conducting that and it's since we're part of the county they're going to do it out in west point at their city hall and those hours will be from 8 to 12. and then lastly but not least I'm excited about this one. You know, we traditionally have our Christmas lighting ceremony in the park. And in the past, we've always been able to have this, the elementary school kids participate in this. They put a program on over at the high school and it's just a, 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 just a fun and exciting event for those children. And unfortunately this year we can't do that because again, we can't do the gatherings and they can't have any type of assembly. So. We've come up with a creative way for the kids to still be involved, and hopefully we will be able to select one lucky child that gets to flip the switch. And in doing, to, in order to do that, they get to. We've uh, come up with a coloring contest. So there, anyone that has any young children or grandchildren or whatever, get online or go ahead and get with our Parks and Rec department. There's a, a nice little fun drawing for them to color. It's and um, we'll end up selecting a winner that will be able to join me on, um, it's always the Monday, be, um, on, let's see, let me back up. You need to have your coloring contest turned in by the November 16th by 5 p.m. and then we'll select a winner and then the Monday before Thanksgiving is typically when we turn those on. So. Anyway, I know that's long-winded, but uh, this was a great opportunity for everybody to kind of understand what's happening here. Okay, um, that's it with municipal event announcements. Unless anybody else has some? Don, did you have one? No, nope, but you mentioned it. Oh, okay. Well, sorry about that. Okay, <laughs> we'll carry on then to our uh, third item on our agenda, which is our verbal petitions and presentations. And with that, I am going to turn the time over to Chief Kevin Ward and uh, acknowledge some very heroic people here. Mayor and Council, we appreciate the opportunity this evening to uh, recognize some true lifesavers within our community. Uh, this group that we're gonna recognize tonight consists not only of uh, medical professionals, but some extraordinary citizens within our community as, as well. I'm gonna bring up the uh, individuals involved at this time. We'll have you come and spread out socially distanced across the front of the <laughs> the dais here. <laughs> Layton City Fire Department Paramedic, Captain Paramedic Dion Santa Stephen. Engineer Paramedic John Morphin. Firefighter Paramedic Gary McCloy. Firefighter Paramedic Justin Siddell. And also Firefighter Paramedic Patrick Cook, but he has a personal issue and could not be here this evening. University of Utah Air Med flight crew consists of pilot Jake Bass, flight, flight nurse Judy Moss, flight nurse Ron Del Pino, and citizens within our community, the Francis family, Malin Francis, Dana Francis, and Landon Francis. At this time, I'm going to bring up uh, Battalion Chief Paramedic 
Jason Cook for the uh, actual award presentation. Uh, Chief Cook serves as our A-Shift Battalion Chief and also functions as the Fire Department's Emergency Medical Services uh, Division Chief and is one of our original Layton City Fire Department paramedics. <laughs> thank you, Chief, and thank you for the honor to let us spend a few minutes today to recognize uh, each of the contributions that these uh, these wonderful partners of ours have made. Um, just before 10 a.m. on August 7th of this year, 20-year-old Brigham Roberts and his father Jeremy were putting the finishing touches on a residential remodel, pro remodel project at a home here in town. Knowing his dad had a lot of paperwork to catch up on and being comfortable with the work that was about to be done, Brigham told his dad to go home and he would finish the job. Shortly after his dad left, Brig Brigham began working on the stair tread for a large patio that was being attached to the home. After making a cut with the circular saw, the blade guard got caught on Brigham's jeans, plunging the circular saw into his upper leg near his groin. <clears throat> Brigham immediately knew that he was seriously injured, describing it to me and Dr. Raskovich when we had a moment to speak with him about it as, I heard myself bleeding. For those of you that don't know, the femoral artery is the largest of our peripheral arteries, arteries that runs through the groin and is under tremendous pressure. Injuries like this are typically fatal in three to five minutes without aggressive bleeding control. He immediately called for help, which caught the attention of Dana Francis, the homeowner. She glanced outside to see Brigham bleeding heavily from his wound, spraying blood from beneath Brigham's hands as he tried to control the bleeding himself. She ran back in the home yelling downstairs for her husband, Mayland, and her son, Landon, to come help her while trying to find a towel to control the bleeding. Dana and Malin desperately tried to control the bleeding while Brigham, <clears throat> from Brigham's femoral artery and vein while Landon made the 911 call. As information became relayed to the nine, from the 911 caller to the responding units, they re realized the situation required an EMS helicopter. Before arriving on scene, they requested the Air Med team located at Davis Hospital to be dis dispatched. Also while en route, they prepared a new medication, tranenzymic acid, or TXA, which preserves clots in our body providing hemostasis, or what we refer to simply as slowing the bleeding process. Latent Fire is the first agency in Utah to carry this life-saving medication, specifically for instances just as this one. Once on scene, Captain Santa Stephen, Engineer Morphin, and Firefighters Cook, McCloy, and Siddall began assessing and treating Brigham's injuries. They packed his wound with additional hemostatic agents, continued to apply direct pressure. Because of the central locations, tourniquets were not an available option. Multiple IVs were established, IV fluids to replace lost blood, and the TXA were administered. Moments later, the AirMed team with pilot Jake Bass and flight nurses Judy Moss and Ron Del Pino arrived, assisting the latent fire units rapidly treat and assess Brigham, and then package him for the short flight to McKay. For the first time at this AirMed base, the crew was carrying resuscitation blood or trauma blood which had just been added to that helicopter two weeks prior. Because IV fluids do not have the capacity to carry oxygen tissues, trauma blood is administered, which then prevented him from bleeding to death, therefore, <clears throat> before they could get him to the hospital. Realizing the severity of his injury and that he would soon die if bleeding wasn't stopped, the team would forgo traditional interventions done on scene, understanding that the only thing he needed at that moment was a vascular surgeon. The team flew Brigham to McKay Hospital where they bypassed the ED, instead rushing him immediately to a waiting surgical suite. Ironically, that day the surgeon that was there was not ordinarily supposed to be there. That was not a scheduled day for him to be there. As his mom and dad waited in the parking lot for hours and hours, they were soon told by the surgeon that Brigham had indeed survived his injury, but that he was expected that the nerve damage would cause him to lose sensation and movement in his leg. Brigham, would you mind coming up? This is Brigham Roberts, everyone. And as you can see, he's happily regained all of his movement, sensation, almost all of his sensation, and full movement of his legs. <clears throat> Without being melodramatic, Brigham should not have survived his injury that day. Every possible thing that needed to go right that day did. Had just one element been missing, whether it be from Dana, Landon, and Malin, not being home, which they weren't supposed to be because of COVID, 
to the latent fire and uh, EMS crew having the ability to administer the TXA, the Air Med flight crew being as close as they were and the ability to administer trauma blood, and the incredible urgency and care that was received and given to him at McKady Hospital. Had just one part of this equation been missing, I don't believe Brigham would have survived. But because of the amazing work of each of these people tonight, <clears throat> Brigham is here today. Because of the Francis's selflessness, the latent fire and air med crew's training and commitment to the highest level of care, and the spectacular care he received at McKD, we get to enjoy a celebration instead of mourn a tragedy. It is because of this that Leighton Fire and Dr. Mark Araskovich, on behalf of the council, um, the, the mayor, the city administration, would like to extend our deepest thanks to each of them and provide them with the Leighton City uh, Lifesaver Medal. Um, I also would like to recognize, too, um, Brigham's family is all here. Jeremy and his mother, Kristen, are here. Um, as you might imagine, <clears throat> as I've spoken about this with others and as Dr. Raskovich and I reflected on it, those of us in healthcare in a 20-plus in a career will only have one or two moments that we truly get to make a difference on an outcome. And... Uh, it's it's awesome to get to recognize each of them for what they for sure will care carry with them for the rest of their life. So once again, thank you. So as you. As you can see, this was one of those gut-wrenching and yet rewarding stories that needed to be celebrated. And my hat's off to all of those involved. And Brigham, I'm glad you're here with us today. You're a fine Leighton resident, your family's great family here. And you know we're just glad that we can celebrate instead of, like you said, mourn. So thank you again, everyone. That was great. Okay, we'll, we'll give these folks a moment to um, go ahead and depart so that we can make sure we still <laughs> carry on with that. We've got, a, we've got another, um, is there one more? Two more? Okay. That's it, right? Okay. All right. Okay. We'll go ahead and proceed then with our um, verbal petitions. The next one is one that uh, I get to present. It will be a proclamation regarding the small businesses. So I'll go ahead and read this proclamation. Whereas the government of Layton City, Utah, celebrates local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and community. According to the United States Small Business Administration, there are 30.7 million small businesses in the United States. They represent 99.7% of all firms with paid employees in the United States. They are responsible for 64.9% of the net new jobs created from 2000 to 2018. And whereas small businesses employ 47.5%, 3% of the employees in the private sector in the United States. 62% of the U.S. small business reports that they need to see consumer spending return to pre-COVID levels by the end of 2020 in order to stay in business. 65% of the U.S. small business owners say it would be most helpful to their businesses to have their regulars return to the start 
return and start making purchases again, and that three quarters of the U.S. consumers are currently looking for ways to shop small and support their local communities. And whereas 96% of consumers who shop on Small Business Saturday agree that shopping at small independently owned businesses support their commitment to making purchases that have a positive social, economic, and environmental impact, and 97% of consumers who shop on Small Business Saturday agree that small businesses are essential to their community. And whereas 95% of consumers who shopped on Small Business Saturday report that reported the day made them what excuse me <laughs> that the day reported makes them what want to shop and eat at small independently owned businesses and year round not just during the holidays and whereas Layton City Utah supports local businesses to create jobs boost our local economy and preserve our communities and whereas advocacy groups as well as public and private organizations across the country have endorsed Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday. Now therefore be it resolved, I, Joy Petro, Mayor of Layton City, Utah, along with the Layton City Council, do hereby proclaim November 28, 2020 as Small Business Saturday and urge the residents of our community and the communities across the country to support small businesses and merchandise on Small Business Saturday and throughout the year. In witness thereof, I cause the sale of Layton City, Utah to be affixed on this fifth day of November, 2020. So hopefully we'll all support that and especially here within our uh, city borders. Okay, next up we'll have a presentation regarding fraud assessment by, our, um, by Tracy Probert. Suddenly it all went downhill, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Mayor, members of the council, uh, the State Auditor's Office has developed a fraud risk assessment and I presented that in your packet of information, you're able to look at that. And one of the requirements of that fraud risk assessment is that I give a small presentation on it in an actual council meeting. Otherwise, we would have done that in a, a work meeting or something like that. So that's the reason I'm here in front of you today. Uh, the State Auditor's Office developed this assessment because they started receiving a lot more frequent inquiries about frauds in municipalities and in state government. And they felt like it would be a good tool for local governments to use. Uh, I would inform you that, that this isn't something new at the city. Your, inter your independent auditors that you hire to come in and audit staff on our financial reporting and so forth have been reviewing these controls and separation of duties and things like that from the beginning. Um, the, the framework was set up many, many years ago, probably 30, 35 years ago, and, and independent auditors have been following that framework for internal control during that time. Uh, fraud, of course, is an intentional deception to get gain for oneself. In other words, to take something that doesn't belong to you, so someone inside the city taking something from the city to, to get personal gain. And so in order to avoid that, we set up internal controls over our, the practices, the ways we distribute and receive funds into the city. Uh, those tr controls, again, are audited by the independent auditors every year. But this assessment does also give us a good tool to go through and evaluate if we have everything in order. Uh, separation of duties, which was a large part of, this, of the risk assessment, had its own separate form, uh, is a very large part of internal controls. And it's one of the most important parts to limit the opportunity for someone to misuse or misappropriate public funds. <clears throat> When we talk about controls, we also have to talk about cost versus benefit. Uh, you know, we could have controls that were so tight that it wouldn't allow us to use funds, right? Because it would take too long. You, you often hear the word bureaucracy, right? That it takes forever to get through the bureaucracy of something. Well, if your controls were too, too limiting, you'd never be able to use the funds for what you need to use them for. So we don't go that far, obviously, but we do consider the benefit of everything. And uh, one of the things that we consider in fraud are